Uh, so great. What we're going to talk about here is the three things every engineer should know about generative AI. Um, you know, whether it's specific to engineering, but really these are just uh, three basic principles. Um, whether or not you're an engineer or not, but we will go through some engineering examples and especially the questions at the end. I'm sure we'll have a an engineering frame or or lens on it here. Uh, so I'm going to try to play this video. We're going to see how this goes um, with the bandwidth and stuff, but this is OpenAI's. Um, this video is 100% AI generated, so you've probably heard of Sora, maybe, maybe not. Um, you've probably seen some clips. You know, there's a few about dogs in the snow and there's the spaceman with a red knitted hat, um, but this one was entirely AI generated. So um i believe the sound should be on uh, if you can't hear it um there's not a whole lot to it but hopefully this works for everyone and, and can see and it's not too too laggy here um but this was actually created by a agency out of toronto shy kids um so it's the first short form All right, so that clip there was 100% generated by AI. Um, so it was just text prompts that created that video. Um, no actual video footage was used. It was 100% AI generated, which is pretty crazy how far the technology has come in just a few short years. Uh, let me get out of here. There we go. So again, we're talking about large language models today um, in ChatGPT specifically, um, but there's many different levels of AI and artificial intelligence. So AI is nothing new. AI has been around for 30 plus years. Um, and you know that's described as the development of smart systems and machines that can carry out tasks that typically require human intelligence. So it's quite a big bucket. A lot of people are using the terminology artificial intelligence today, where they usually mean large language models or generative AI, such as ChatGPT. But really, it's a it's a much bigger bucket, as most engineers are are aware of, and have been using artificial intelligence at different levels um, throughout the past few decades. Uh, a subset of artificial intelligence is machine learning, so that's actually using algorithms that can learn from data and make decisions based on patterns. As we start breaking this down into further deep or subsets, we have deep learning. So that's using artificial neural networks to reach accurate conclusions without human intervention. Um, so we're getting more and more advanced and uh, technical uh, and able to do more with artificial intelligence technology. Generative AI is fairly new to um, to our work lives, and it just means it can generate new content. So not necessarily just text, which is what most people are familiar with, but also images. Uh, you've probably seen some pretty crazy images created by Midjourney or Dali. Um, there's a lot of different tools out there that are available, and now videos too. So Sora is OpenAI's video generator, and it's probably going to be released later this year to the public. 
Uh, it's hard to say how it's going to be released or what kind of um, payments going to be a part of it. Um, but it is, you know, it's very much just write a paragraph, put in some text, and a video will be generated automatically. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is mostly on the large language model scale. So this is tools such as ChatGPT, Gemini, Copilot, Claude, lots of different tools out there, and it's using deep learning techniques and massively large data sets to understand, summarize, and generate new text. So the three things that we're going to cover as far as everything an engineer should know, basically, how does it work? Um, if you know how it works, then it's going to help provide a good foundation of what it's good at and what it's not good at. Um, so that's where we're going to start um, at a very high level, not going to get very technical here. Um, and then we're going to talk about what is it good at and what is it not good at and what should it never do or never at least replace humans as it stands right now. Uh, and then at the end, we'll kind of talk about what it can do specifically for you, and that will morph very closely into a demo and Q&A. Uh, so if you have any questions or thoughts like, can it do this for me? We'll cover that at the end. So of course, I had to ask ChatGPT, you know, how do you work and explain it in two sentences? So this is the, the first shot, the, the first uh, response that it gave. I thought, well, this is pretty good, so I'm going to pull it right into the the, uh, the presentation here. So large language models like GPT work by analyzing vast amounts of text data to learn patterns, relationships, and the structure of language. Um, and they generate text based on probabilities of what word or sequence of words comes next. So it's very much an iterative, you know, probability-based machine as far as creating sentences. It, uh, it doesn't truly understand, it really mimics and it uses a neural network architecture, which is basically like the brain, and nobody quite knows exactly how it works, which is kind of interesting. So that's why there's a lot of testing, a lot of training, a lot of iteration um, for a lot of these products, and that's why there's still hallucinations. Um, but it's trained to predict these sequences in a context-aware manner. So there is some level of understanding based on your question and the prompt that you're providing it, uh, as far as how it gives you that response. So a few key things here, patterns, relationships, and structure of language. It's really, really good at that. It's been trained on so much data that it understands language quite well um, and how to write it, uh, how to summarize it, how to improve it, um, and then all the different structures and nuances of, of different languages. Um, again, it's just a probability making machine. So it's just looking to figure out what's the next best word in the sequence. The neural network architecture is kind of like the brain in the background, and there is some level of, of context awareness uh, to these models. So a little bit lengthy for two sentences. So I asked it, you know, can you uh, explain it like I'm five years old? So it says, imagine a very smart robot that has read lots and lots of books and remembers every word. When you ask it a question or to tell a story, it thinks about all the words it knows and picks the best ones to make sentences that make sense to you. So you can still see the levels here, the patterns, the relationships, the amount of data, um, the context awareness of picking the best ones that make sense to you. Uh, so same idea, just explain much, much more simply. So to try to visualize this, um, you know, LLMs really are, when you boil it down, they're a next word predictor. Uh, so simply how it works is it takes what it's already been provided or what it's actually um, giving as an output. So you're going to say it's going to provide the cat sat on. That's going to feed in as a token into the large language model. It's going to look for the next best word or token to come. And so it's going to give each of those words a probability. So looking at the cat sat on, what's the next best word? It could be the, could be a, could be it. It could be some other word or combination. Again, this is all based on its training data set and all of the different sources it's looked at. It's coming up with this hypothesis of what's the next best word. And if you ask LLMs or ChatGPT to be creative, you know, to be innovative, it's going to be a little bit more nuanced in what the word comes. It might 
change these percentages so it might choose an ah uh or an it later. It's not actually being more creative, it's just being more loose in the percentages or the predictions. So most of the time, I'd say 60% of the time, it's going to choose the, it's going to feed back in, and then it's going to cycle this through. Okay, now considering this input, what's the next best word? Could be lap, could be mat, could be rug, you know, and so on. And then it's going to iterate through this process at lightning speed to give you your final answer. So there's no thinking ahead. There's no planning. It's just understanding what the prompt was and what the question and figuring out what the next best word is based on what you asked and what it's already starting to provide. So very, very high level, that's how it works. So based on this, what is it good at? Um, and you can see here, it's it's really good at a lot of things, especially specialized tests. And you can probably, this makes sense because if it has these specialized tests in its training data set, and it understands those patterns and those relationships, then it's gonna be good at answering those types of um, exams. So you can see here, the verbal, the GRE, it's a scores in the 99th percentile. So of 100 people that have completed that exam, it's better than 99% of, of everyone else. And you can see here as you work through the exams, it's very good at the SATs, law exam, um, math exam, which is interesting because LLMs aren't good at math, but they're good at understanding per, uh, language and uh, the training data set. So it's going to regurgitate what it knows, even though it can't actually do math. Uh, you know, the LSATs, biology, biology statistics here, uh, and you can see the differences here on the left between the green and the blue. It's the difference between chat GPT 3.5 and chat GPT 4.0. So if you're using the free version of chat GPT, you know, you're getting these results in green. Um, if you're using the blue uh, or sorry, using chat GPT 4 and paying for the chat uh, for the plus subscription, then you're getting what's here in the blue. And it's actually probably a little bit better, um, you know, just based on the iterations and the updates that have been out there since. Uh, so you can see there's some things that it really just isn't good at. Uh, we have English language, English literature, um, you know, calculus. So just based on, you know, it's training data, it's not able to answer questions, um, you know, accurately or, or high quality based on what it's it's given. So the first thing that it's really good at, and this is fairly obvious, is it's great at generating text. So it's coherent and relevant text in any structure. So whether it's poetry, fiction, um, you know, novels, fact-based history, any, you know, coding, it's good at any structure. It's good in any language, whether it's English, French, um, Python, C, any sort of coding even made up languages such as Klingon, um, if it's a part of that training data set, it's really good at translating and understanding many different languages. Um, so it's much better at translating text than Google Translate, for example, um, which is you know not based on a large language model and, and connecting that together. Uh, and it's also very good at context. So if you wanna write something at a very technical level, engineering level versus explain it like I'm five, it can go anywhere in between that range um, or based on role or anything else um, or based on personality. Uh, it's it's can do all of that as long as it's been a part of the, the training data set here. So as an example, you know, I can ask ChatGPT to draft an email to my boss who appreciates verbose emails. Um, so again, that's kind of the, the structure. Uh, I'm unable to work today because I have a sick kid. Sign off with a humorous sentence in the style of Jerry Seinfeld. So this is something that I, I tried in ChatGPT, and this was its first response. So you could see as an email, this is very verbose. If you were to read through it, you'd see it's you know a lot of language, a lot of extra description. Uh, it's kind of, you know, you'll see here some Jerry Seinfeld-ish, you know, PS, why is it that every time a child sneezes, it's like they're resetting the family schedule more effectively than any power button on our devices ever could. So I'm not saying ChatGPT is funny, but it's able to take all of the different elements of your prompt and put it together in a response. 
And you can see because I haven't provided any information about who I am or who my boss is, it's giving you know um, placeholders for you to to change and, and fill that out. So number one, generating text. Uh, number two, understanding language. It has a very deep understanding of grammar, syntax, nuances, idiomatic expressions, you know, especially between languages. If you have an expression in English, it may not translate directly to German or Japanese and same vice versa, um, but it's it understands those nuances and those expressions. Uh, so it's really good at summarizing information. So if you have a report, um, you know, an article, a book, anything like that, that's a part of the data set, um, or you can have something that's very long and you can paste it in and say, please summarize this into three bullets or four sentences or into a table format, uh, or what are the key actions from these, this meeting transcript? It's very good at understanding and then summarizing. Uh, it's very good at translating, as I mentioned before, so from you know any language to language or even language to code or code back to plain English, very good at that. Uh, and then it can also be used to improve your writing. Um, so it's like an advanced spell checker or grammar. Um, you can ask for it to be more concise, more clear, you know, expand, shorten, whatever you think, or if you ever think there's any gaps or weaknesses in your writing, you can get it to focus on that element and then improve that. So based on our example of the email, I've kind of broken it down into three steps. So the first would be summarize the key points from this email. So the boss gets the super long verbose email, doesn't have time to read it, copy and paste it in the chat GPT. And here we go, summarized in bullets. Uh, so they read that, say, great. All right, can you draft a friendly response that wishes his kid better health? Now do it in French. So here we go. It's a whole email in French. My French isn't that good, but to me, you can see all of the the accents, you know, the the nuances of the the language, and that looks great. And then at the end, you can say, oh, you know what? That email is too long. Please keep it the same tone, but limit it to five sentences and in English this time. Sure enough, here you go. A very quick, short, simple email, still very friendly. And um, you know, it could cover exactly what you need to do in this situation. So the number three thing that it's good at, and uh, you know, a lot of people use it this way, is to answer questions. So you can almost think of it like an advanced Google search, um, because it's trained on so much information in these curated data sets. It has a lot of strengths, strengths such as general knowledge. You know, it's it was trained on scraping websites and specific uh, books and historic documents and all of that stuff. You know, it's a curated data set, so they're picking the best of the best in order to be fed into the large language model. Um, so if you're looking for any sort of general knowledge questions, uh, historic information, et cetera, it's quite good at that um, based on the last training update. So I think for the old version, it might be two years out of date for ChatGPT 3.5, for ChatGPT 4, I think it's September of 2022, it might be last April. Now it suffice, or it helps supplement that with access to the browser, so it adds the current information into your answer, um, but in general, large language models, you know, up to that training date and what they're trained on, general knowledge is, is a really good use. Obviously, it's really good as a conversational agent, um, so you're seeing a lot of use now with businesses as chatbots. Um, so giving a response based on the question, um, but even as like a brainstorming partner, that's probably my biggest use uh, as far as answering questions. I have different thoughts and ideas, uh, context questions, uh, and it's a really good tool to go back and forth with. And then patterns and relationships. Um, if you have two very unique or distinct ideas that you want to bring together, um, you know, thinking of innovation, it's often just one source or one field or industry brought into another industry. It's very good at doing that together. So one example I have here uh, as an industrial engineer, do some work with manufacturers, background on Lean Six Sigma. Um, so I wanted to see how well it would do here where, you know, our organization is a job shop. So we deal with a large amount of custom orders. We've struggled to implement Lean in our organization. 
act as a lean consultant trained by Toyota with expertise in job shops. What recommendations do you have? And here we get a response of 10 different ideas or recommendations of how to implement lean in a job shop. So I went through these, you know, some is, is quite, is a little generic, um, but nothing here that I saw is, is incorrect. Uh, so it's a great starting point for if you want to test something or try something or see what's out there. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff that you wouldn't necessarily be able to Google it unless there's already a written website or document or article on that specific question. Um, so if you're getting very particular what you're looking for, uh, obviously, or usually ChatGPT is a, a great starting point. So what is what are large language models or ChatGPT not good at? So a few of these have kind of hinted towards uh, ahead of time, but the biggest thing right now, and if if you're up to date in artificial intelligence, there's this terminology out there called AGI or artificial general intelligence, and we're not there yet. And it's quite a big leap from the large language models and what it's able to do versus the future of AI. Um, and the biggest thing there is it can't think ahead. So there's some really interesting case studies where, you know, ChatGPT is obviously just wrong, flat out wrong. Um, those engineers might be familiar with the Towers of Hanoi. Um, I had a little bit of a refresher back to my coding and industrial engineer where you have three sticks and five disks, and you're trying to move one, um, the stack of disks to another, and you can't put a larger disk on top of a smaller disk. So even though it's a fairly simple problem, um, it takes some planning ahead or some thinking ahead in order to execute it. And large language models can't do that. Other artificial intelligence models can do pieces of it, um, but right now it's it's not a part of the LLM. So there's some simple, what I will call simple problems that involve math, that involve like predicting and simulating that or generative AI is just not, not good at. So it might seem in some cases it is thinking ahead, um, but again, back to that next word predictor, it's just using that next best word. So it's not actually planning ahead to the end of its response. It's just going one word at a time. So that is definitely the probably the biggest weakness right now. When AI is able or when um, you know open AI and these big companies uh, are able to figure out the thinking ahead, and that's where a lot of money and compute power is going right now, uh, it's going to revolutionize AI uh, for, for everyone. Uh, generative AI and large language models are not good at complex math. So as I mentioned before, um, you know, because they can't think ahead, they can't do math and arithmetic. They don't actually understand it. Um, so if there's enough examples of one plus one equals two in the training data set, then it's gonna be able to do that calculation. Um, but otherwise, if it doesn't have that specific calculation or those patterns, it's not going to be able to do that. Now, how ChatGPT gets around that is if you have the paid version, it integrates with Python. So it's using code and Python in the background to do that math based on natural language instructions. Um, but if you didn't have that tie into coding, it obviously wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, similarly, with real time information, Large language models only have a specific training data set, and obviously it has a cutoff, uh, especially these large models. So unless you are paying for something or have a model that integrates directly to a browser or to the web, um, it's not a good agent to, or not a good use to actually look up real-time information. Uh, another weakness I'm sure lots of folks have heard of are hallucinations, and this is where ChatGPT sounds very confident with the answer, um, but it's just making it up. <laughs> um, so in older models, you'd see, uh, especially with with URLs, it would just make up URLs. So you'd prompt it and say, OK, that sounds interesting, but I don't think that's right. Can you provide the source to where you got that information from? And it would make up a URL because it's trained on URLs where the article name would have dashes and be at the end of the, uh, the URL link. It would make it up when you went to click it. It wouldn't exist. Um, so it can sound very confident in its answers, um, but just make it up. And again, that's just because of the next word prediction. Uh, it can often go down into weird roads. Uh, 
especially if you try to um, confuse it or you're very confident in your question, uh, it can actually push it down in a wrong, wrong road. Uh, in general, generative AI, uh, it's it, it overgeneralizes its response, um, so it's not going to replace that very deep technical exper expertise because it's trained on a very broad data set. You know, the answers sometimes are going to be very, you know, cookie cutter or or general or, you know, paint it with a very broad brush. So something to be aware of um, when using it in in different scenarios. Uh, it can't multitask or it's not good at multitasking, very similar to humans. So when you're using a prompt, you should try to keep it to one objective or one type of output. As soon as you ask it 10 different things from 10 different sources all in one prompt, it's going to confuse it. And there's definitely some recency bias in there about how you structure out your prompt. So try to keep it simple uh, and focused when you're using the prompting for generative AI. Uh, it's not great at contextual or specialized advice. So it doesn't know you, it doesn't know your organization. So you can obviously give it some of that context in the background, um, but it's it's going to be very generic in its response. And obviously there's some very sensitive ethical issues um, that AI is not not good at or not understanding. So it's going to use, you know, patterns and, and data in the large language model. And, you know, it's a next word predictor, so it's going to go in the most obvious direction. Um, but sometimes that can lead it to be a very biased um, approach. So there's some examples where uh, I believe it was Amazon was doing hiring and because of certain uh, geographical regions where traditionally it might not be the best candidates, um, it was very biased in screening out employees um, that were kind of based on, on racial or gender or other types of stereotypes, which uh, obviously was not what they wanted and had some very serious consequences. On top of some of the risks, the weaknesses, there are some risks. So privacy is one. Obviously, you don't want to share any personal identifiable information, uh, especially if you're using the free version. They're using any of sort of your prompts to train the model. So they don't want to use personal identifiable information um, or com confidential information or you know proprietary business information. Um, so just be careful and be aware of what you're sharing with the model. Uh, a good rule of thumb is if you wouldn't share it online, if you wouldn't share it on social media or post it on your website, then you probably shouldn't be sharing it with uh, these different types of platforms. Secur security is um, a risk. Um, Sam Altman did an interview with Lax Friedman last week, and you know he talked about state actors trying to hack the system. Um, so it shouldn't be any surprise that cybersecurity is, you know, one of their biggest concerns and they're putting a lot of time and energy and money into security, but there's always a risk of it being breached and being hacked. So even though the, the information should be kept private and even if it's not used to train the model, there's always that risk. So that's where there's that risk reward of, of what you want to get out of the, the platform and what you do and don't want to share. Uh, in general, large language models have a tough time explaining their answer, um, so it's just going to come up with a response, and it's not always able to reproduce that answer. You know, as that next word generator, it could come up. You could ask it the exact same question, or even just change a word, and you can get an entirely different answer. Um, so it's hard for for some folks, especially, to say, "How did you come up with it? This seems correct. This seems accurate. This is uh, you know great output." but it's hard for the model and hard to understand exactly how it got to that output. And then reliability is that kind of reproducibility. Um, you can share the exact same prompt with a friend and say, I got a great response, try this, and they get an entirely different response is because, you know, once you get down a different path in those different words, it's going to structure it in a different way. Um, fairness, uh, obviously, you know, it's based on the training data as far as what kind of output it brings. And there's also data scientists in the background, um, you know, testing and training and, and tagging the data. So there's always gonna be some element to, um, you know, bias in the training. Uh, you may have heard of Google. They did their um, image launch through Gemini and it had issues. Um, it was over diversifying, let's say, the the output of images. Um, so there's always going to be some human element to how the model's trained 
and that may not be fair in, in all cases. Intellectual property. Um, generally, what is given to you by these large language models, there's no IP attached to it. You know, it's yours to use, um, but that's not to say it might not accidentally share some things that are intellectually, you know, it's IP of somebody else that you can't reuse. So again, something just to be aware of. Environment's an interesting one uh, because inherently just using the model, there's no environmental concerns. Um, but AI in general, the amount of power and compute it's using and the whole supply chain of AI uh, can be very disruptive to the environment. Uh, I read a tweet the other day about how you know they're trying to do this compute and if they had it all in one state, it would be shutting down the power grid. <laughs> so there's lots and lots of energy and power being used. Again, I don't know if that's going to change your habits at all, but just something to be aware of. And then, of course, social, which is quite a big bucket of just how people use AI, how it's changing their behaviors um, and how they interact with others. Uh, just again, something to be aware of. So what can it do for you? I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Um, this is just a model or how I think of prompting uh, ChatGPT uh, or other LLMs. Uh, and, and then we'll jump right into some, some examples here. So the acronym I like is co-creator, and you've probably heard the term co-pilot, whether that's through Microsoft or just AI in general. You know, it's not autopilot. You shouldn't just give it the keys and let it go, but it's a great assistant or buddy or co-navigator when you're using it. So uh, I like to think that ChatGPT creates, it generates, so co-creator is a, a good acronym here and something that you can remember um, as you're using different um, ChatGPT or any other LLM really um, to, to get the best response or output. Uh, I'll say now is don't worry about taking notes or anything here. If you're interested in these slides, I will be sharing them after. Um, just fill the feedback form, share your email, and you can get a copy of these. So number one is character. And really what you want to do is you want to treat G chat GPT like an actor. You want to be able to give it a script and give it context in order for it to provide the best response. So think of any method actor, you know, Christian Bale. Is Christian Bale going to be the machinist at 121 pounds or is he going to be Batman at 240 pounds? So give it some more ideas, um, give it some context, give it, you know, um, a, an objective and it will give you better responses. So for example here, um, you are a social media expert specializing in LinkedIn that has worked at a digital marketing agency for 20 years. So what hat is ChatGPT going to put on for you? And the more descriptive you are here, the more it's going to narrow its focus on its training data and likely give you a better response uh, as a result. Next thing you want to think about is the objective. So really, this is, you know, what's the request? What's the ask? What do you want it to provide to you as a output? So here you could say, you know, draft a LinkedIn post on why it is important to start using generative AI on a regular basis. Next, we're going to do context. So what's any background information that you need to give? What does ChatGPT need to know about you and your situation, your role, your position, your business? Um, any supporting background information that you think would help in a response. Um, so often this will be come out as like a, a purpose. So the purpose of this LinkedIn post is to engage my target audience and demonstrate my thought leadership and capability. So that's kind of the, the context behind the, the purpose or the objective. Next, we have readability. And so this is, you know, based on the audience. Who is this text going to? Um, so is it going to be something that's very technical in nature? Is it going to be something that needs to be read very simply? You know, what's the language? You know, what level of, of background or experience or expertise do they have? Uh, and that's going to help craft uh, your prompt. So for example, write in a clear, concise, natural, and human-like manner. Um, and hopefully just a simple prompt like that will help it be less robotic in its response. Uh, next, we have examples, and examples are probably the thing that, in my experience um, working with other uh, clients, is it's the most underutilized piece of prompting. 
ChatGPT doesn't understand, it mimics in its response, you know, based on the training data. So the more examples that you can give it, format it like this, you know, draw on this, um, this type of writing, this type of post, uh, it's able to take that and mimic it very, very well. So the more examples you can give or the more detailed the instructions with the example, uh, the better the response will be. Uh, so oftentimes I'll usually add this to the end of the post and I'll say, you know, add some some hash marks there uh, and use this as a guideline to craft your response. Uh, we also have additions. So these are small little tricks that can get better responses from the AI. Um, so these are little like hacks and tricks and say, you know what, if you do this really well, I'll tip you a thousand dollars or there are serious consequences um, for doing this poorly. Uh, another one I've seen is this is extremely important to my career. Um, so please do this to the best of your ability because it's trained on human data. Um, you know, and human data often has these types of incentives or punishments or rewards or pressure. Uh, it actually, you know, studies have shown it does a better job with these little additions. Um, so again here, you know, I'm going to tip you or I'm going to penalize you. Um, you know, I haven't seen a huge difference in responses, um, but that's not very statistically, <laughs> you know, I haven't applied the statistical analysis to it, but others have. And it's small, but um, you know it's it's often worth you know experimenting and trying these different additions. Next, we have type. So this is just the format or the type of response you would prefer. Do you want it in a table? Do you want it in a bulleted list? Um, do you want it you know in a lengthy paragraph, email, social media post? You know what type of output is it going to be? Uh, so for this LinkedIn post example. You know, I'm going to break it down here, you know, include a catchy hook at the beginning. That's fewer than 15 words Add a clear CTA or call to action at the end of the post. So you can, you know, kind of break down, including like if you want headers, subheaders, bullets, anything like that as a part of the uh, response. Uh, second last year we have Orient. Um, and this is just. Sometimes you don't know if ChatGPT has the, all of the information it needs to give a better response. So you can ask ChatGPT is, do you have all the information you need to give an output or to give a response? Or is there anything more that I can share that will help you create a response? Um, and so you can add a prompt like this, you know, before answering, ask me for more information or details that can help your LinkedIn post. So it gives the LLM an opportunity for it to orient itself and to see if it's got all of the information. Um, so you can get some more of that up front instead of it providing garbage and then having to fix it later. And finally, we have rationale. So uh, this is a good, you know, uh, you may have heard chain of thought prompting or processing. And the more able you're able to do it step by step, with ChatGPT and ask it to explain its thought process, the better response it will have. Um, and this is kind of twofold. First, it's great to see how it thought through and for it to provide the thought process, because if it skips something or something looks out of whack, then you can kind of see um, the background to how it was thinking. Um, but also when it explains its thought process, it actually gives a better result here because you're actually forcing it to slow down and think through it a little bit more sequentially uh, or step by step, where if not, it sometimes the response isn't as good. Uh, so a simple prompt here, think through your response step by step and show your thought process can often give better responses as well as give you a little bit more insight into how it came up with the response. So if you bring it all together, this is a bit of a, a mega prompt. So I'm not saying I, I use these types of prompts all the time. Um, depending on the ask, I might use different elements, uh, but you can bring it all together to, uh, and it works quite well because there's only one ask or one objective. You know, it's not multitasking, it's still very focused, but it has all the different elements it needs to give the best response um, in general here. So in summary, you know, give it a roll, make a request here. Here it is right here. So to wrap up, you know, when I think of you know sharing this with folks, and if you're new to ChatGPT or haven't used much AI before, think of quantity versus quality. And I like to reference the 
um, story that James Clear shared in Atomic Habits, that there is a uh, photography class, I think it was out of the University of Florida, and the prof split up the class into two different groups. And he said, group one, you are focused on quality and you're going to be only graded on quality. So you take the entire semester and I'm going to grade you on your best picture, best photograph. And that's the only thing that you're going to be graded on. I went to the second half of the group, the quantity group, and said, I'm going to judge you just solely based on the quantity of photos. I don't care about quality. The more photos you, you produce, um, the better your grade is going to be. And so both of these groups went off um, and did their entire semester. Uh, and at the end, the quantity group, even though they weren't being graded on it, had a better quality photo than the quality group. And that's because they were constantly testing, experimenting, trying different lights, you know, trying different setups. I don't know all the photography stuff, but because they're focused on quantity and trying all these different things, they actually had a better quality at the end instead of the planners and the ones that were a little bit, you know, more strategic in their thinking and not testing as many things out. Um, so I want you to think of, of ChatGPT and other AI in that way. You know, think of quantity first, then quality, because that quality is going to come from the reps that you put in. So try expanding your prompts, shortening your prompts, you know, try different priming. So that would be the, the context, you know, as an actor or specific person or role. Um, you can ask for concise answers, for detailed answers, ask for sources, ask for different formats. Just give it a try, try all the different things and, and you'll be, you know, you'll, you'll learn a lot just by doing that. Uh, my final piece of advice is to chat, treat ChatGPT as a new grad. Um, so that's me just in graduating with my iron ring here um, with my, my girlfriend at the time, now my wife. And, you know, coming out of school as a new grad, a lot of positives, but also some some negatives here. So the positives of a new grad and of ChatGPT, eager to assist, you know, can help in all different types of tasks. It's ready for anything, you know, broad and current knowledge base, uh, you know, compared to some of the more senior folks in the organization that might be a little bit set in their ways or may not have, you know, that continuous learning. The student often does. That continuous learning attitude, you know, ready to assist in any way, and the ability to offer different perspectives because they're new to the organization. They don't necessarily have that context, but they can share different things. But the challenges with a new grad is they have very little real world experience. <laughs> they don't know how to take what they've learned in, in education and in school and how it applies to the real world. The same can be said about ChatGPT. Doesn't know your context you know, all that organizational history and culture. Uh, it's limited to its training data and information and will sometimes make stuff up. You know, you might have a bit of a, a cocky new grad, you know, maybe overconfident and will just uh, sound very confident when in case they're, they're not. So how do you use this? Well, you need to pr provide proper guidance, examples and instructions. So the more examples you can provide, the more structure, uh, and nuance and instructions you can give it, the better response it will be. Um, if you do something often, those are the best scenarios to get them to help. Um, so that's where you're going to save the most time is you have very repetitive tasks using chat GPT and especially the custom GPTs and other AI modules that kind of layer on top, uh, which we don't have time to talk about today. But those are the best cases, those repetitive tasks and processes. Those are the best ones to automate with AI. And most importantly, they need their work to be reviewed. So don't take anything that comes out of ChatGPT or any large language models. Never copy and paste. Always add your own style, your voice. Always double check to make sure that it's accurate and not hallucinating, um, that it's not biased, and that it's you know matching and fixing to your work as you need it. So um, I'd like to just take a couple minutes here um, just a breather for myself, um, but I also want to collect feedback. So let me know in the chat if this was of value to you. Just give me a thumbs up, yes, or you know, even more. You know, if if something in particular was most value, let me know. Um, it'd be great to hear from you. I'd also like, and if this did provide value to you, I'd like to get a little bit of value in return. Just fill out a quick two-minute feedback survey. Um, you can scan the code here. I'll put the URL in the chat too. 
it's less than two minutes. Um, just very curious of your thoughts today about what you learned, um, you know, what was good about it and what I could improve. Uh, also, if you share your email, um, that's how I'm going to be able to provide the slides to you. So uh, you can fly through the feedback form if you feel not you don't want to give it, but at least send me your email. Um, there's an option to sign up for an email list if you click no, but still share your email. I'll be sure to get the slides your way. Uh, I also have my email address there if you're curious to learn anything more or any follow up questions that we didn't cover today. Um, yeah, so take a, two minutes. Let me know in the chat when you're done that feedback and then we'll move into to questions and I'm sure there's been some coming through here uh, and we'll I'll open up chat GPT. Give me a moment to get that set up and we'll we'll answer some questions. I will say there's lots of government funding available. So if you want to start doing AI sort of training, consulting, there's lots of good programs out there, uh, especially in Nova Scotia, the WIPC program for training. So if that is of interest to you, um, just let me know and, and we can have a follow up conversation. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing for a moment as I get things set up. Um, I'm going to throw in my URL in case you didn't get that code to fill out the format or the feedback form. And then Christine, you may have um, some questions coming in here. That might be a good place to start here soon. Okay, uh, before we okay. open the floor to questions, I'm just going to remind participants that there are two ways to uh, pose your questions. One is through the Q&A uh, and the other is to raise your hand and you will have mic access to pose your question. Um, before we allow mics, we do have a question in the Q&A from Michael Owens. Um, he says, how do I see the items that Robert is talking about, i.e. the verbose email? Um, so those were just outputs from ChatGPT. So if you open up ChatGPT, it's easy to sign up for a free account and put in your email address so you don't have to pay for it. Um, you know, you don't you miss some features, but otherwise it's it's still pretty good. And all I did was I put in the 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 prompt there, the question about writing the email, and then it generated the response. So hopefully you're able to see it on my screen as I went through it. Um, uh, otherwise, that might have just been the slides, but hopefully that worked. And but it's just as simple as prompting; it will give a response, and then you can just copy and paste and and use that however you you wish. I don't have any other questions in the Q and A, so I'm just going to go back to the attendees for raised hands, and there are currently no raised hands. Um. All right, as folks are doing that, if there's any more questions coming in, maybe they came through the chat, let me know. Um, sure. I'm just going to open up my uh, chat GPT and do a very quick um, demo of, of how it works and to kind of showcase a few things here. If there's any questions, feel free to, to jump in, uh, especially if anyone has questions about the tool itself and how to use it or, or has any questions or um, ideas or examples that they want to see if it works or not. I'm happy I to, do, to showcase I do have, that. I actually have a question in the chat. Um, as a professional, what's your advice about encouraging or discouraging colleagues and train and trainees to use general AI? I'm an educator and universities are really wrestling with banning or embracing Gen AI when our job is to help students learn to think critically for themselves. Gen AI makes it quite easy to offload your thinking. I'm concerned that we're heading for a world depicted in this cartoon, and, and there's a link to that specific cartoon. Oh, I'm going to have to look at that after. Um, yeah, no, it's it's a valid concern, um, but I think the same concern happened you know, decades ago. Like when the calculator first came out, people were thinking, uh oh, now people are never going to be able to do math or never be able to critical think now that there's a calculator. Um, and the same thing happened with the internet, with Google. Oh, now everything you can search in Google and no one's going to be critical thinking. I think this is just the next step to that. So it is something to be, you know, curious about and to think about. Um, and I know there's different, like I'm coming from my own biases and my own opinion here, uh, but there's so much value that it can offer um, that I think it would be a bad idea to just ban it or outlaw it or, or shut it down. Um, I've had a few conversations with some profs at Dalhousie and there are mixed opinions there, um, but I know some of the more innovative ones are saying, yes, feel free to use it because 
it is going to be a tool that you're going to use after school and in the workplace in a lot of scenarios and, and maybe it not might not be like chat gpt but eventually other organizations are going to have their own large language models and their own ai that might be a little bit more protected for the data that's being shared uh but it's it's going to be used and it's going to be mainstream soon enough so it's better to use it understand it understand the strengths the weaknesses uh so i know a lot of profs are saying use it but you're responsible for everything that is created from it and everything that you put into this report and fill out this template or this guideline to show how you used it, where you used it, and kind of show your work um, into the background of, of how you iterate it with it. So um, yeah, I, that's my opinion on it, but I know there's lots of different other opinions. Um, um, so I think you need to be cautious and purposeful and intentional when allowing students or others in the organization to use it. Um, but you definitely need the frameworks, the policies and the guidelines in place, especially in business where there are privacy and security risks uh, at hand. We have another question in the Q&A from Macklin. In respect to security and privacy, how can governments use LLMs? Are there options that offer more privacy than OpenAI's LLM chat GPT? Yeah, so with governments, especially like Microsoft has Copilot, um, which can keep everything within your SharePoint or OneDrive. So if you have all of your documents there, it keeps everything in-house. Um, so you don't have to worry about it, um, you know, leaving your organization or being trained elsewhere. So that is one option. Um, another option that some organizations are, are starting to travel down that path is to build their own large language model. Or sh I shouldn't say build their own, um, but there's a website called Hugging Face, H-U-G-G-I-N-G-F-A-C-E, um, where it has all of the best open source large language models. So you can download a large language model run it locally on your machine and you don't have to worry about the data going any results um, and then you can take that and fine tune it yourself and make some changes and updates uh, so that's a very cost effective way to do it is the open source llms they don't cost anything um, but you know take a little bit of fine tuning where other organizations the big ones are, are building these llms from scratch which is like millions of dollars to do um, so depending on the level of the organization, uh, there are definitely some alternatives to ChatGPT and sharing your data and, and keeping it all in-house. I have another question in the Q&A from Paul Hubley. Bias is a key concern. Biased inputs will equal biased outputs. Wondering how to mitigate that. Maybe compare with non-AI research in a separate stream, i.e. two-eyed seeing. Yeah, that's, um, I mean, Yes, bias is definitely uh, a challenge with AI, but I think bias is a challenge without AI either. Everyone's going to bring their own biases, so AI can actually be helped to use to mitigate your own biases um, and to test against that. Uh, but yeah, you're right. I think there always needs to be a human in the loop, um, reviewing the responses and, and bringing a, a non-biased lens to that. So whether it's one person doing that or several people or a committee, I think it's more of a risk reward thing here where, you know, in a lot of tasks, you might have very small instances of bias that really don't matter. If something's a little bit more important, public facing, um, you know, sensitive in nature, then you'll definitely want to have that level of um, review on it. So, I mean, in general, going through the model, like there's not a, I, I don't see a lot of ton of bias, you know, it's trained and there's a lot of parameters in place, but you definitely still want to check that and have somebody review that from that lens. Another question in the Q&A from Eric Penny. Any tips on how to detect if something has been created with AI? Example, text, image, et cetera. Uh, there are some tools out there that you can say, like, what is the probability that this was created with AI? Now, they're not 100% accurate, um, but I've, and, and there's some tools, and they're open. Like, you can just search, like, AI-generated, like, detector, and there's some out there and you just copy and paste the text in, um, see what it produces, uh, and then it will spit something out. But, you know, that type, it's not it's not 100 percent accurate. So I'd be very cautious about how you're using it and how you're enforcing it. If you're telling somebody that they use AI and they say they don't, then it's kind of a, a he said, she said scenario. Um, 
but I would focus more on you know using generative AI in a in a smart manner, um, in a safe manner, and um, and and how you're going to share that and set policies within the organization. And at this point, that concludes the Q and A questions, and I have no raised hands. Awesome, and we're only one minute over. So thanks everyone for your time. Um, there's a link in the chat here, so feel free to click on that link, um, share quick feedback. Um, you can also ask questions in the notes there, and I'll try to review everything. Otherwise, my email's in the chat, um, and happy to have more, more discussions about generative AI in the future.